All right, let's talk about spatial data. It's really easy to take this for granted because it's everywhere around us. It's on our phones, we're collecting it ourselves without even knowing it. Um, and every time we, you know, do a Google search uh, on our maps, we're finding spatial data. Um, so we're gonna talk about what spatial data is, get you thinking about it, think about how it relates to the real world, um, and then introduce one of two primary formats for storing spatial data. Um, in part two of this first lecture series, I'm going to describe the second data format used um, to represent mappable features, and then introduce some of the important properties that we use to understand and describe these two different formats. But first, let's talk about what GIS is. What is GIS data? What's spatial data? And what does it represent? First, I think it's really important to simplify what GIS is. With GIS, we're connecting databases to maps. And then, of course, um, you know, any GIS class will tell you that GIS is about collecting, managing, storing, analyzing, presenting, um, networking, spatial data. It is all of that, but at its core, GIS is about connecting big databases to maps, to spatial locations. So if we think about this lone uh, old-fashioned phone booth out in the middle of the desert, we can collect information about this place, um, non-spatial information. Uh, what is it? It's a booth. Um, what color is it? Not available. Not, you know, not, in, not interesting. Last service, uh, whatever, area code and what phone number it is or what identifying number it is. Anything we want. What road is it on? Um, who used it last? There's all sorts of information that we could collect about this phone booth. We can also understand where it is and we can assign it spatial coordinates, right? Both of these things, the attributes associated with the location, that's GIS data. But then we have to start thinking about what does that mean for the real world? We've looked at maps like this a million times. Every time we open our phone um, and, and look up the nearest gas station, we're looking at maps like this. So we can have aerial images or satellite images of the ground that show us the detail, you know, at some scale. And then we can overlay uh, map features on top of it, roads or streams or ponds or um, building footprints, um, all sorts of data that we can layer on top. But I want you to start thinking about how this data is created. What scale um, is it designed to represent the real world at? And what kinds of things are we, um, um, you know, smoothing over or generalizing? What are we losing? What kind of detail are we losing when we simplify a real world feature down to some sort of map feature? Think about the real world and how complex it is. You know, if we have a surface like this and an aerial image, we don't get any of this real, uh, real information. We might be able to say, well, we can map trees. We could maybe create a point for where we think each tree's trunk is, and we could um, attribute that point with the vegetation type, maybe the canopy height, canopy density, um, you know, some kind of burn ratio maybe, like how likely is it to burn or some sort of fuel load. There's lots of data we could, but how are we really going to map that trunk's location? Maybe we map the grove of trees by just creating a, a line around it, a boundary around it, and then assign a general vegetation type to that area. So we can't represent the world at true scale because then the map would be the size of the world. So generalizations have to be made, and then I just want you to think about, you know, what's the fidelity that we're losing when we simplify like that? Because simplification is necessary, of course. Um, I think we all get a little spoiled by high resolution, streaming speeds, megapixels, and we have come to expect a lot of precision in our data. But the other side of precision is accuracy, and you need to consider both of these things. Um, how precisely we can capture a complex real-world feature is different from how accurately we're capturing it. We might uh, be able to digitize the exact uh, point locations of each trunk in a grove of trees, but if we assign them the wrong tree type, it's inaccurate. 
highly precise but inaccurate. So both things really need to be considered um, when working with spatial data. Spatial data has a long and relatively ugly history. A large chunk of it, stuff that we use every day, was created using very archaic methods. Um, we traced paper maps. Um, we used kind of transparent overlays on a tabletop and traced things. And then that stuff got digitized when computers came around. We, you know, kind of transferred things into computers. But some of the origins of this data is very old and very coarse. So be curious about the lineage of your data. Okay, so how do we represent the real world? Like I said, we can't make a scale a one-to-one -one map. So details are going to get dropped and in comes uncertainty. Um, the person making the map is the one responsible for generalizing and making those kinds of generalizing decisions. Um, so it's up to the user and the user's purpose for the data to decide what are we going to keep and what are we going to lose. Like when you think about um, an aerial image of the ground, even in black and white, we're storing one value. If we collect it in color, we now have three wavelengths that we're collecting about that area. We might be able to um, um, image the area from a satellite collecting infrared and other wavelengths, and then we can start really extracting some more intense information. But what's the scale that we're doing that at? Um, when we collect an image, as you know from televisions, from photographs, we uh, capture this data with pixels, and the pixels can be different sizes. So if you have one great big size that's generalizing over a bigger area, we're losing information that way. So, um, yeah, lots to think about here. And then if we take that same area and just capture building footprints and boundaries, we're generalizing again, because where do you define the edge of, you know, the ocean, for example? We've got tidal issues, we've got... Um, where is the edge? Where is the edge of a grove of trees? Where is the edge of a soil type, right? So then we could have lots of lots of um, different layers and high resolution, or maybe we're simplifying down to just the very basics, a very different scale here. Okay, so that's it for basic GIS data introductions. Now let's talk about one of the two primary data set types. We've got vector and raster data. Vector data is, if you have done any kind of graphic design, it's, um, it's data that's created by points, points that connect into lines, and then lines that begin and end at the same place and have rules about how they're filled to create polygons. That's vector data. It's defined by coordinate locations and then rules for how you combine these together. But it's called discrete because data exists at the point and then rules about how they connect. There's no data in between the points. There's no data on either side of the line. With raster data, you need to think of it as a matrix. It's like a photograph in that it's a grid of cells and each cell contains a value. So there is going to be data everywhere, even if the data um, stores a value of no data, if that makes sense. It's like a blanket that you lay across the landscape. Um, we could represent this landscape by just outlining um, the lake and either making it a line feature or a polygon, but you'd have one feature and then nothing. Okay, so vector data models. Discrete representations of geospatial features modeled as coordinate pairs. They can be connected by lines, and then when the lines start and end at the same place, it becomes a polygon or a shape. So vector data has three geometry types, points, lines, and polygons. And these points, um, lines, or polygons are described by attributes. And so the real power of vector data is in how we can attribute these locations. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So just so we're clear, points are a single xy coordinate that represents a geographic feature that you would display that way because um, it's too small at a specific scale to represent any other way. So if we're looking at a global map, um, we might represent cities with points because we're not going to digitize or, 
uh, create the boundaries of each city with some kind of a shape. You'd never see it at the scale of a global map. Lines um, have a length and a direction, but no area. And it's what would connect two XY coordinate locations. And then a polygon is a two-dimensional closed feature that represents an area. It's pretty, it, it's pretty intuitive, I think. The attributes are the cool part. These are non-spatial properties or characteristics that describe each one of those coordinate locations. Um, we can store attributes in the column. So these are the descriptions. Like for example, with fire hydrants, each one might have an identifier. And then we can start collecting information about each fire hydrant. So the row is the object, the feature, the location. It could be a line segment. It could be a, um, a data set that is a bunch of um, alpine lakes. Each row would represent one of the lakes, and then the columns represent the descriptions of each lake. That's how spatial data is organized in vectors. So looking at a real vector table here, this is, um, this is an attribute table of some census blocks. You can see that there's an identification field. It describes the geometry type, so these are polygons, and then a bunch of information. The code that represents which block it is, a descriptive name, the population, um, the area, things like that. This, you can add attributes to describe, you can add features to the rows. The attribute table is, I think, where the power of vector data comes in. This is where you can um, create different searches, right? We can obviously view all the attributes in the table, but we can also create searches, run queries that say, find every cell or every polygon, you know, in Logan that has a population of at least 150 people, right? Or we could calculate population density by dividing the population by the area of each block, and we could look for the most dense or least dense uh, census blocks. We can sort based on attributes like population, um, just like an Excel spreadsheet, really, but connected to a location. Some of the advantages of vector data are that we get very precise location features, which is excellent, but you have to be careful of the other side of that, where if you have a point that's representing a city, is point representing the geographic center of the city? Did somebody just randomly place it somewhere where the city might be? Um, a point is a dimensionless feature. It's an exact XY location. So if you say, I want to I want to find properties within five miles of Baltimore. Well, if Baltimore is being represented by a point, Baltimore might be six miles across, so you're already in a little bit of trouble. So you really need to think about what the geographic features are representing. Um, but you can store a lot of related attributes, and I'm talking hundreds of columns if you want to. Um, they're very easy to edit. You can just pick up and drop points and resave them in a new location. Same with lines. You can draw your own vector data. It's very easy to work with. And it's a compact storage type. It's XY locations with a very easy to attach um, attribute table. Suitability, it is good for mapping uh, roads, streams, uh, creating polygons that represent you know, discernible features. Um, you have to be a little bit careful when you're using vector data to map things like soil type or things that don't maybe have a hard boundary because you are giving it a discrete boundary when you use vector data. Okay, and then briefly here, selecting by attribute is the term we use, and you can find the tool in the table itself or you can find it um, on the main tool ribbon. Um, this is where we can start leveraging the power of the attributes themselves. Um, the select by attribute role, sorry, the select by attribute tool uh, basically lets you set up a query where you can say where the population is greater than or equal to 500. And when you hit apply, it just selects those rows from the attribute table. So in this census block attribute table, there's over 3,000 different census blocks in this county, Cache County. And if we um, set up a query where the population is greater than or equal to 500 and apply that, it selects 12 
out of the 3,000 or 3,800 census blocks. And you can see it um, highlights them in turquoise, and it also selects them in the attribute table. So pretty handy. You can clear the selection and start over again if you want to change it. It doesn't do anything to the data other than just select it. Um, this is a really incredible tool. You can also add new queries. So you could say where the population is greater than 500 and the area is you know, less than two acres or something like that. So you can uh, make composite selections. Uh, shape files, it's really important to know um, that uh, vector data is referred to as a shape file. Think of that as the geometry, point, line, and polygon. Um, they're also referred to as feature classes. Don't get weirded out by the terminology. If you don't know what something is, just Google it and you'll find it. And people have been blogging about this stuff for eons. So shape files are represented um, really cleanly in ArcGIS. And I'll show you the clean version in a second. But if you view a shapefile in Windows Explorer, you're going to see that something like the Census Blocks data set has um, a bunch of different file extensions. So Census Blocks CPG file, a DBF file, a PRJ file, all of these different file extensions composite together to make one workable shapefile. And you're going to see something called an SHP or a shapefile. This is not the same thing as the data that we saw whoops, drawn here in this map. This is a census block shapefile. But to get that to draw, you need um, the database file. These are the attributes. This projection is the coordinate system framework that defines where the geometry is located. Um, this is the actual geometry itself. So this is the storage of the XY coordinates. This tells us what framework they should be drawn up in. These are the attributes. And then the rest of them are a bunch of index files that are critical for drawing the data set. So you can't just go in and grab this guy, email it to yourself in a computer lab, and expect that data to draw. It won't draw correctly. So at the very minimum, you need the shape, you need this SHX index file, and you need a DBF database file. If you drop the projection file in this intro class, you're going to have issues because um, you don't have the information to create these yet. So here's, here's the solution to that problem. Goodness gracious. In, um, in Arc Pro or Arc Map, there's something called a catalog. The catalog is like a digital filing cabinet for your spatial data. When we look at the census block data set in catalog, this is just your file tree here. Notice that it's just showing you the census blocks.shp. This .shp is not the same thing as this shp. This is just the geometry. This is an alias or like a storefront that's um, combining the DBF file, the PRJ file, the index files, and the geometry shape file, but it's called a .shp. It's really wonky that they did it this way. But it's your job to know that this thing is aliased when you're looking at it in ARC, and it's not aliased when you're looking at it in Windows Explorer. So the good practice is to use the catalog if you're moving data, um, saving data, transferring data. Do it here so you don't accidentally drop one of those critical file extensions and end up with corrupted data. So what I like to do is manage all my data here if I want to share this with somebody, I would you know, maybe create a new folder and copy and paste these into the new folder and then share that folder with somebody um, using Windows Explorer or however you're doing it. But transfer and copy and paste all your data within um, the Esri version of a file storage. It'll save you a lot of hassle. Um, and then just finally, remember, Vector data is a representation of a real and very complex entity. Roads have a width, lines do not. Road polylines aren't going to track the center line exactly. They're not precise representations, they're generalizations, and there are errors. Um, you know, intersections aren't going to be at the exact geometric intersection center. So when you're calculating things in um, GIS, 
Like, for example, if I were to ask you for the length of this road and the units are in meters, are you going to report, you know, 222.6243976, which is precise to like the thousandths of a millimeter? No, because, because that's not going to be true. Um, ARC will give you that level of precision, but it's up to you to understand that that's not correct. Um, round. Know that this is a representation, it's a generalization, and, you know, give me a number that's to the nearest meter, maybe. Um, that's true for your own research. It's true for um, any kind of sharing of your results. When you control the precision of the data, you're letting people know that you understand the essence of spatial data. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Uh, we'll follow up with part two talking about raster data.